Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our Friday noon seminar. Today we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Uh, pardon me, Dr. Tim Stikatovich. I think I got that. Uh, Tim is a professor, associate professor of radiology at the University of Wisconsin. He specializes in all things CT from reconstruction algorithms to technologist workflow. Protocols developed by his team have been shipped to 3,500 sites around the globe. He's currently on the editorial boards of the at the Journal of Computer Assisted Tomography, Journal of Thoracic Imaging and Radiographics. And uh, luckily he's made time in his schedule to talk to us today about deep learning image reconstruction in CT. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, uh, Tim. Thanks, Peter. Thanks for the introduction. And yeah, super happy to be talking to you all. And thanks, thanks a lot for this invite. So let's start. So uh, we're not going to read the abstract. You guys, you guys have that. But I'm, yeah, this is a topic I've been researching for a number of years and clinically involved in. So I'm really excited to share some of my experiences with you all. Um, I do have a number of conflicts. I work with two of the major CT vendors. Uh, I'll be talking about some of their products. So um, I don't personally receive money from either of those major vendors, though. So first off, most importantly, I grew up in Western New York, which uh, is really close to Canada. So I grew up on this island here called a Grand Island in the Niagara River. Just want to point this out. So I, this was my house was like right around here. Canada was right there. I could see Canada from my driveway. Um, so that's kind of kind of neat. Got to spend a lot of time in Canada um, in Niagara Falls region. So just up up river from from you guys. So a number of the slides and some of the content um, is in these two review papers that I um, I was honored to be a part of this one that got published in Radiology. I led this one, um, and importantly, this one actually has two co-authors that are from CT OEM. So if you haven't seen these, these are relatively recent. I think they're both open source. Or if you can't find them, email me and I'll send them to you. But they review the latest uh, iterative and, and, and deep learning reconstruction methods. So I think to start, I want to summarize some of the radiology community acceptance of, of, of iterative methods. So uh, I think what is important to like historically realize, the development of these IR iterative methods were concurrent with a lot of dose reduction efforts in general, right? So it was no like coincidence, right, that image wisely <laughs> came out in like 2010 and Ace, uh, Acer was the first um, vendor, this is a vendor trade name for one of the methods came out around the same time frame. Why? Well, there were some problems in CT at the time, right? There were some reports um, um, and th th this was happening. I, I don't mean to say reports like it was reported, but we don't know. Like for sure, there were CT scanners out there causing um, tissue uh, effects and, and hair loss and so forth. Like you can see here, this poor little kid got burned in the face and these folks are losing um, significant a portion of their, of, the, of their hair from perfusion exams. So that motivated the community. We got to do something. So some regulations got changed and we also had iterative reconstruction. So that's what this is from. Uh, I went way back in like RSNA and found some vendors like, you know, slides from their uh, marketing materials. And, you know, this is what they were toting back then. You could go from a filtered back projection to an iterative and lower the noise and then use that noise lowering to trade off to lower your radiation dose. But basically, immediately when that started happening, radiologists started complaining. What kind of radiologists started complaining? A lot of abdominal radiologists, a lot of neuroradiologists, not as many um CV radiologists, and we'll talk about that. But you can see, hopefully, you can appreciate why they complain. So this on the left is the texture of a normal filtered back projection type image. And it just has a look and feel that they've been used to, the radiologists, for decades in, in CT. And then all of a sudden, the vendors come out with these fancy new IR methods. And you can look here at the you know, outside edges here, this kidney cortex, and just see it's all smudgy and kind of nasty looking. And when they're looking for little smudgy things that might be a lesion, a cyst, or whatever, little little metastasis, and now all of a sudden we're making images that have those kinds of appearances all over the place, the radiologist's job gets a lot harder. My rads call this like um, pseudo lesions that kind of pop up when we have some of these severe iterative um, uh, artifacts. Now, 
the image noise, what happens to it? It goes way down when we make our images look like that. So if we just look at what happens to the noise and like you could think of like this top curve is like FPP and this bottom curve here is like when you add all the fancy IR methods, noise goes way down. So flip it over here. Now the CNR goes way up when you use those methods. So one could think, well, great, my CNR is super high. I'm going to crank my dose down. But when you do that in practice, you end up losing a lot of diagnostic performance. And this is what this prospective patient uh, consented study showed from my institution where um, I wasn't involved with this, but I know what they did. You know, they, they, they did two scans, one at a relatively full dose and one at a severely lower dose, which would have been theorized by, you know, that should have been acceptable because we could get all the noise back um, via these IR methods. But that really wasn't the case. People started missing things when we took advantage of that huge amount of noise reduction. You know, there are good examples out there, though, of this being applied. Like in this case, this was on a pediatric patient where instead of going 70% dose reduction, you know, the author said, okay, let's try a little bit more modest. You know, we'll go a little like 40% dose reduction and apply some of these IR techniques. We don't introduce all those pseudo lesions and, 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 and people are happy here. But in the so I mentioned earlier that neuro rads and abdominal rads were not you know they were not happy why because their tasks and I <laughs> hope there's no rads on the call I don't want to say in some ways are easier diagnostic like detection task if there's like a low contrast you know um, object that's really um, hard to see that's really that's a that's a hard task compared to some CV tasks where you have this iodinated uh, vessel with a huge amount of signal um, contrast and in those tasks that's where a lot of radiologists found that they were willing to accept this kind of more patchy noise texture like I've been been uh, alluding to. So in the first um, here, this is these are images from like the first um, recognized as the first vendor implementation of these IR methods. You can see here there's pretty patchy images on the right, but these CV rads were pretty happy with this because their tasks didn't require to identify any little pseudo lesions that might look like those noise patches. However, even in that first paper, they did point out that they did have this plastic appearance, but for this diagnostic task, you know, it, it wasn't a problem. So we have to be, you know, o o aware of that. So kind of in summary of some of this, we, we have to realize that our community had a lot of high doses. We were in some cases having exams that were being performed wrong and we, we burned folks. And I think the biggest benefit of that might not have been IR, but it might have just been the fact that, hey, maybe we don't need to be imaging a routine abdomen you know, average dose at 30 milligray, maybe that can be down at 15 milligray. And that kind of pushed the community to do that. And if IR played a role in that, so be it. But I don't really think personally that that was the real big motivator there. Um, IR methods, the, the phantom results don't always predict clinical results, right? That study I showed you with those huge CNR uh, increases, that doesn't always apply to patient population like I showed you for that liver example. And then lastly, we got to know the diagnostic task. Right? If it's a really high contrast angio task, maybe we can throw on a ton of IR noise reduction. But if it's not that kind of task, then, then it might not be as applicable. So let's take a step back and just talk about a little bit more about CT reconstruction in, in general. So here showing just kind of a high level view of, of how we can look at CT reconstruction. In CT, we might have, we have the CT scanner hardware itself. We add a patient and we get some data. Okay, and then we take that data and we do some sort of reconstruction like filtered back projection and we get an image that the radiologist is going to look at. So in this type of a workflow, we have the data and the reconstruction here. We're not making a ton of assumptions on what is being imaged and we'll unpack this by what I mean in a little bit more. In other words, I could put a dinosaur bone, right? I could put a tree trunk. I could put someone, you know, uh, a head of a, of a human in that scanner. And this reconstruction algorithm will treat it the same and produce an image for the for the radiologist. I think the big thing to understand about why we see some of these weird behaviors with iterative reconstruction algorithms is because we're making a lot of assumptions on the object being imaged, which may or may not include modeling of the scanner itself in this case. So here, some of these assumptions that we might be making are, well, maybe there's no CT number changes greater than 1,000 Huntsville unit between like two pixels that are next to each other. Right. That might be a completely reasonable assumption that we might make uh, inside of our patient. Right. We might make an assumption that there are flat regions of, of, of tissue um, inside the patient. Um, and we could take advantage of that to try to denoise them. Things, um, things like that are assumptions we're making about our patient. Well, again, I'm going to unpack this more, but I just want you to start thinking, you know, in, in this way.
So in an ideal case for denoising, we'd have some really noisy image. We would somehow denoise it. And if we took the subtraction of those two, we would just have like a picture of noise left over. There'd be no signal in this image. It would just be noise. In the real world, that's like nearly impossible to do. Um, especially like in this example, say if we just applied some simple method for denoising, like a mean filtration, you reduce the noise standard deviation a lot. But when you look at a difference image, there's a ton of signal that we lost, all the edge detail we lost. So we can do better than that. Um, you can think of a non-local means filtration as being a little smarter than a mean. So in a mean filter, it just looks around all the neighbor pixels, takes the average of them and puts that value there. The non-local means filter does is a little smarter. It tries to look around for only pixels that are like the current pixel in terms of maybe is that pixel on an edge and it only looks for other edge pixels, so forth. So it can preserve by not blurring across those edges and it can do a much better job. There's still some signal content over here, but mostly just um, noise. So let's unpack that a little bit. What I said about it can look around and, and find pixels like it, you know, spoke kind of not really technically there. There's a paper that's been cited, you know, over 8,000 times, like MATLAB references it in its non-local mean filtration. I think it's a interesting paper to try to understand at a more intuitive level how some of these denoising algorithms work. So in this case, like if you've just got a pixel sitting out here in space, the algorithm might look around and grab and find all the other pixels that are similar to it and find a lot of pixels. So anything white in this right image, that can be that inf data from those pixels can be used to denoise this point. Right. If I've got a pixel here that's along an edge, these algorithms will look for all their pixels that are like this pixel. In this case, all the pixels along that edge and use information from those pixels to denoise that one and so forth. This is a little crazy example here with this with these bricks and so forth. But, you know, hopefully you get the idea of what some of these more nonlinear algorithms um, are, are doing when they're trying to denoise. So when we go back to like an actual CT scan, what that means is that those brains or those mathematical description of looking for similar pixels would say, hey, if I'm a pixel right on the edge of this little vessel inside this, uh, this is a bovine liver, I'm only going to um, include other pixels that are like me along this edge when I try to denoise it, okay? But it's also important to know, how do I know I said I'm on an edge? Well, that's depending on the local contrast level. So in this case, it's really nice. I have like air because the vessel is not filled with blood. This is a dead bovine liver. Um, so I have a big amount of contrast. It's easy to detect that edge and do the denoising we need to do. Likewise, we can have algorithmically, we can describe pixels that are in a more uniform region and then find a whole bunch of pixels around us that are just like us in terms of being uniform when there's no edges being detected. But again, we don't detect the edge because might, might, we're going to have some threshold of contrast level that we say there's an edge or there's not an edge. So I'm not going to go through all the math because that'd be super boring and it would take a long time. And there's many different formulisms to mathematically describe everything I'm talking about. I'd recommend starting with that first paper I, I showed you there with the cool left and right images showing the weightings. But um, we won't go through that. But that's mathematically we can describe everything that I just have been talking about. We'll, we'll do a little bit here because total variation denoising is one of the most popular ways that in the scientific literature, people have done iterative um, denoising uh, regularization. So total variation denoising basically assumes something that's really not true in humans, that there is piecewise constant signal variation inside the human body, which like works great if you have some sort of like 1D signal processing, like in this example here I stole from uh, Wikipedia, and it can do a really great job, say, denoising an image. But if you look closely over here, it introduced a lot of those pseudo lesions that I've been talking about earlier on those clinical cases. And then when you look at these researchers, you know, I'm not picking on any one here. I've published papers using total variation minimization. It works great on, 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 a, on a phantom like this, but it, it this phantom is piecewise constant. So of course, a method that would try to enforce piecewise constancy would work right there. So when, when people are doing iterative um, methods uh, for image reconstruction and trying to denoise, this is one of the most common forms of regularizers they're using for reducing noise is this total variation minimization, which again, assumes this piecewise constant structure. So one way of thinking about this is in the case where we had a signal, like this is the background and there's our signal and there's no noise, the regularization might be awesome here. It might preserve our signal perfectly. But the second I maybe add some noise into my signal, then it can't detect that there's any edge there and it might completely wash that away. 
So this introduces a nonlinearity in that the performance of the algorithm now depends on the level of noise, which means it's a dose dependent algorithm, and that's not good in the clinic. Likewise, if the signal is really small, we could have an algorithm that's signal level dependent, like I'm showing in here. That's also not good in the clinic, right? If I've got a um, little lesion that just enhances a little bit, one of these algorithms could completely wipe it out versus a lesion of the same size that enhances a little bit more, say on a, on a given series, that it would be retained. So now let's go back to like the actual CT world instead of those toy models I've been showing. We actually see all of these things I've been talking about in the clinical implementation by the CT vendors of all of these algorithms. So in this example, this is kind of the seminal paper on, on, on doing a more advanced, um, going beyond the regular linear systems characterization of a CT scanner. They, these get, this paper introduced this concept of the TTF, or the task-based um, function for, for, for spatial resolution. And what they showed was for FBP, or filtered back projection, which is a more linear algorithm, not making assumptions about the object, the MTF looked very similar depending for bone, acrylic, and polyethylene. In other words, across contrast levels, not that much change. ACER, which was an iterative method, and, and MVIR, which is just a different flavor of, of iterative, a little more advanced, we saw big changes here. Whereas the higher the contrast level, because bone has the most contrast, we saw the better performance. So that algorithm, mathematically, when it it's going to see the edges in the bone better, so it can identify more pixels associated with that edge, and it can, and it's going to retain them better than something that's a lower contrast edge like polyethylene. So when you hear people talking about like nonlinear iterative, what the heck does that mean? It means this: there's an unequal amount of spatial resolution that is getting passed depending on the contrast level of the object. Likewise for dose. So I remember I showed you that example of those noisy, that noisy one that the total variation might have wiped out on us. We see the same thing in the vendor's implementation of, I can't remember if this is ACER or MBIR here, it doesn't matter. It's just one of the nonlinear methods. It has a dependency on the, um, the dose, where the higher the dose, the better job it can do. So going back to here, I just wanted you to remember, one of the key things here is that these methods are, are nonlinear in that they look at what the actual object is that's being imaged, and then they try to find pixels that are similar to a given point in space. So now I want us to think about that. So one of the jobs of these algorithms is to go and find pixels that are similar to a given point in space. Well, how how, I can, how hard can we push that, right? Can I do a CT scan of the whole chest and pelvis and look at a pixel in the pelvis and say, oh, I'm on an edge of a bone. Like, oh, there's a bone up in the chest. Can I go look at a pixel up there and, and, and try to use that data? Like, of course not, that, that's ridiculous, right? So when we think about this, this is something I, I thought about, and I, 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 I don't know, I haven't seen it before, but I'm sure someone else thought of this. I, I have it in my book, and I talk about this concept of data space, where when you have a really thin reconstruction, there are a lot of pixels within a short physical distance of that pixel that very likely might have similar information that you can go steal and, and grab and, and use to denoise a given pixel. Whereas when you're at a fat slice or a thicker slice, you don't have as many independent data elements to do that. OK, so what that means is when we have a thinner slice, there's kind of like more independent data out there that we can grab and use to denoise versus when we have a thicker slice. So if you think about this for a little bit, you come to the conclusion, well, that would probably mean that when I have a thinner slice, I get more noise reduction. And that is exactly what we see in some of the vendors implementations of these nonlinear algorithms. This is a this is. Um, uh, an example from uh, Canon, where they, one of their methods for um, iterative denoising, and they find that it's more effective for thinner slices. And the argument I just talked about on the previous slide, I think exactly explains why that is. Because if you're already at a five millimeter slice, the vendor's not going to go out 15 millimeters, grab data, and use it to denoise there. But if you're at a little sliver like 0.5 millimeter slice, they might go out a millimeter and a half three times, use some of that data to, to denoise there. So as a clinical physicist or research physicist, when we're trying to evaluate these 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 things, I think these are some of the um, the ways I think about it. I think that are helpful to explain the results. All right, so let's get it more more clinical. Uh, you know, maybe some advice I'd have on when we're trying to evaluate these things in the clinic. One of the things I love to do is just take a difference image. So when I'm trying to understand a new vendor's implementation of a denoising algorithm or a reconstruction algorithm, taking the filtered back projection version or the and then subtracting the IR or using IR, but maybe at different strengths if the vendor allows it. Usually they do have different like levels of strength of denoising. 
subtracting those two. And then what we're looking for is, like I showed earlier in the ideal case, just noise. So the more content that you see here, then you know that's the more kind of signal that you're that you're losing, or at least that's being modulated in some way between these two different um, reconstruction um, flavors. And this can give you an idea too for like maybe regional performance, right? So another great work out of the uh, the group at, at, at Duke, what they showed was that depending on what the background texture is, the algorithm might be able to find more or fewer pixels that are similar to the pixel you're trying to denoise. So when you have a very uniform background, you can find a lot of pixels, you can do a lot of denoising. When you have a more textured background, that noise reduction goes down. So again, clinical, if you if you're a clinical physicist, you got to remember this and like that measurement you took in a water phantom may not mean anything then in a textured lung field or in a um, brain or liver, et cetera, where there's a lot of background modulation going on. All right. So that was a lot of my understanding of FAP and, and IR. And then we looked at a bunch of papers and, and, and things, but now, you know, the focus of the talk, we want to talk about what's up with the deep learning and, and how is it different? So in the same way I said, um, we started out by saying FBP doesn't make assumptions. And we said IR makes some assumptions and we went through a whole bunch of examples of, of that. I think this is how I kind of think of the, the, the AI-based methods. And those, they're, they're highly a function of how they are trained, okay? But most of, they're gonna assume that the image objects and the noise signal that they get in are gonna be like the cases that they were trained with and will We'll talk about that. So here though too, I added a new element into this box, okay? So we've got the scanner and the patient, right? They're gonna produce data and the reconstruction algorithm makes images for the radiologist, but heavily influencing how that reconstruction algorithm is gonna work is how the algorithm was trained, okay? With the advent of these deep learning and now multiple uh, three CT major OEMs to my knowledge today have them, and there are multiple third parties that do PACS-based denoising, and I'll mention a few of their names uh, soon. They work pretty good compared to IR, in my opinion. I've evaluated them. I've seen others evaluate them. And we, for the first time since like, what, 2010 or so when Acer came out, we actually have algorithms that can lower the noise, maintain spatial resolution, and not produce those nasty noise textures that we had seen with the IR algorithm. So that's what I'm showing here. We have a bovine liver again. Uh, you can see, you know, there's some noise here, but it's FBP-like noise. We're not inducing pseudo lesions like over here on the right. This is an IR at this highest level I could. And it's like, this is almost a joke image. Like I would never make this and show this to my abdominal radiologist. You know, they would be like, okay, get the scanner out of here. There's too many of these things, like I said, pseudo lesions in here. The one in the, the, one in the middle, this one, very FBP-like noise texture, just the magnitude is down. So we can quantify this, of course, as physicists and uh, GE did in this in this white paper, and we I you know independently did this in our in our in our analysis of this, as have other authors. But hopefully, you can appreciate that <laughs> joking noise texture with full level of IR pushes all that power really far to the left or at lower spatial frequencies, and that's where the pseudo lesion kind of complaints come in because now we're talking about length scales on the multiple millimeters that are mimicking those little tiny metastases and lesions, whereas the um, deep learning, we don't see that problem. So here's another example. That was a GE example. This is a Canon example showing the same thing. We've got a noisy FPP-like texture um, here. Then we've got an IR method, which is trying to denoise that, but kind of maintaining some of those big spotchy noise peaks because this is an IR. And then on the right, the deep learning version, which has a more FPP texture again, but the noise overall reduction um, or magnitude is lower. So there's a bunch of different ways to train this. So in the review paper um, that I did with the folks um, out at Stanford, we we talk about a bunch of these different ways. Okay, so we'll just kind of go through these three major ways. So when you think about how we would train an algorithm to do this, well, you could give it a low dose sinogram and a high dose sinogram and use that to train, right? You could make a network that says, this is going to be my input, a noisy sinogram, and I want the output to look like this. Where do you get two sinograms like this? You know, we're not going to do thousands of patients across the world with two different scans, low and high dose. There'd be a lot of issues with that type of a study design. We can just add noise to a high dose sinogram or a normal dose sinogram. Um, it's outside the scope of this talk. We could talk about it in the Q&A, but you can add noise to this guy, simulate this guy, use that to train your network. 
you can validate that in your factory with a bunch of phantom and anthropomorphic phantoms where you actually do real low and high dose and so forth, but that's how you do that. This is kind of where the PAX vendor based ones or the third party ones work where you don't have access to raw data, but you still want to denoise. You can take a high or regular dose image, add noise in the image domain, and then you get this and then use that to train your network. And you can then you don't need access to any of the raw data. <clears throat> you can also train um, your network to go right from the sinogram space right to the um, image space um, in, in all in one step. So in this step here in the top, you would then take this and pass it through a, a traditional reconstruction algorithm. Down here, you actually have the reconstruction inside of your network. So I think for simplicity's sake, I in, in our review, in the other review paper we did, we just kind of broke this into two, two buckets. You got your scanner-based methods that are going to go from sinogram to an image. They might have an intermediate step there where they reconstruct the, the better sinogram into the image. You know, they'll probably never tell us exactly how they do that, but this is important to know you need sinogram data. And then the PAX base uh, vendors, and I, I think I mentioned them by name later, but a couple of them are like Clary Pi. The other one is Elgo Medica. They have a product called Pixel Shine. I'm sh I would bet anything like Terra Recon, like they would probably have a, uh, they probably have a, a method for this now. And there's probably a few others, but I know Clary Pi and, and Pixel Shine are out there. They do this where you, you take an image and then you get out a better image at the, um, you, you get a noisy image in and you get a, a denoised image out. And the vendor handles dealing with the sinogram. They just feed the uh, PAX face vendor a noisy image. So what, what kind of results do then we see? When I mentioned before, I was excited to be looking at these awesome results from deep learning. Well, we don't see the effect of contrast level messing up our MTF, right? So now I don't have to worry about some little tiny lung, lung nodule that may is not really, you know, uh, hyper intense or something getting washed away in the reconstruction. Um, I don't have to worry about some little subdural bleed, you know, getting uh, wiped out because of the reconstruction. Um, what it looks like here is that there's not a dependence with this deep learning on the contrast level. As you can see here from air, poly, acrylic, and bone, we have very similar performance with the DLIR and the FBP, whereas the IR methods are, are not so. And I'm these, again, this is from that first paper from the Duke group, but others have shown this for the other major OEMs like Siemens um, and Sapphire Admire and, and the Canon um, algorithms as well. This isn't just like a GE thing. It's anyone who's doing this nonlinear denoising thing. But in the world of the deep learning, we're, we're, we're not seeing that behavior. Uh, same thing with dose. Um, I think yeah, I showed these results before. With dose, we saw this change in performance. It's the brains of those algorithms or the mathematics. It's harder to identify edges. It's harder to see little contrast differences. So we have a dose dependency. We're, we didn't see that as well with the DLIR. So when we take those difference images, you know, it's not perfect. I don't see just noise. I can still see a tiny bit of anatomy here, but it's like night and day better than what we had seen previously from the IR space. So this is difference images up here from IR, difference images down here from the um, deep learning uh, method. So that's why I think it's important now when we're talking about these methods is some of the conclusions I've been drawing, they haven't been true for every deep learning method out there. So when GE first, or when Siemens, ah, we tried the third time, when Canon first came out with ACE, they trained it on model base, their first algorithm. So they trained it, they got their good quality images from a first recon, which was an advanced IR method, which had IR method like noise texture. And I don't know the internal decisions on you know what that was, but in their first product, it produced a deep learning image that had kind of a noise texture that people saw as being similar to IR, and people didn't like that. So very quickly, um, now when you when you have an ACE recon, it's now trained on a what they call like a high dose FBP. So when you're training, the point I want to make on the side when you're training on FBP as your target, you're going to get an FBP like uh, noise texture, and I think. That's really the key um, development with the deep learning methods that we didn't have with the IR. So these are just some of the results that we've seen at, at Wisconsin and how we kind of made them into the, you know, clinic. The word I want to use is clinicatized, but I don't think that's a real word. How we translated our, our phantom results and so forth into our clinic. So 
we had been using um, Acer V in our clinic, say for routine heads. And these were the typical cuts we'd give rats. We'd give them a five millimeter for the, you get good gray white matter differentiation, but you're not going to see a little tiny subdural, like one millimeter bleed, right? So we'd also give them a one and a quarter cut where they're not really getting good gray white, right? So they're not going to see some big, like subtle infarct type thing sign, but they are going to be able to see a little tiny hemorrhage or something. When we switch over to DLIR, it's really cool because if you look at the thin slice here, this basically has a very similar CNR, but at one and a quarter slice thickness as what we used to have, give our radiologists at five. So that's really key. So now the radiologists can see these little bleeds and so forth on an image like this, but they're getting, they can actually see the, the gray white like they were on, on, these, on these thicker slices. Here's a case from the abdomen, kind of a similar observation at the thinner slice DLIR like here. We're getting performance like we used to get at a five millimeter slice with the Acer. So at our shop, we clinicize this by saying, this is great. We're not actually going to lower our doses to try to make, you know, this image look like this image. We're just going to, you know, keep where we're at, but our image quality at these thinner slices is going to go way up. So the diagnostic confidence of our radiologist for heads and bellies and so forth, like I'm showing here, um, you know, has improved because of this. Here's another example. This is a, a coronal reformat, um, just showing kind of a, the same thing. This is a pediatric case where we have uh, this huge mass here um, compared to the previous um, methods with using the IR, IR techniques, just a much better performance. So I keep talking, I, 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 thought I spoke a lot about the, what those little subdural bleeds look like. So here's an example of that um, here on, on this slide. So we can see here in the posterior part of the brain, that's the kind of finding that we're talking about. So they used to make this kind of call, just seeing that little tiny dot, you know? So I think for some of us that are, that are physicists, like to appreciate um, that that's the kind of, when, when I said a long time ago that, and when we started the talk that um, the neuro rads and the body radiologists, they're really, you know, picky about the noise texture. This would be a clinically significant finding for one of these neuroradiologists. So like, obviously they're highly trained. They can pick up on this kind of stuff right away. Um, and it's not easy to uh, see there. Very, you know, not easy when, especially when you fatten up the slice to the five millimeter, but it makes it just that much easier to see when you're down at this one and a quarter slice thickness. Okay, so um, clearly if it's not evident by now, I think understanding these al algorithms by what kind of assumptions that they're making, I think is the key way that I personally like to think about them. And that did go into the review that we did for um, uh, the Springer our article, which yeah is open access. So one of the tables there, and we'll kind of go through this a little bit, is breaking down the various vendors' algorithms, what kind of type they are, and then what kind of assumptions they make. So pretty much today, I th think it's still possible to do a filtered back projection on most any vendor. Um, sometimes they force you to use their IR or other modes, depending on like if you have a really little slice, some vendors might force you to use IR, but most vendors have some way to like set their IR to zero or do something like that. So it's still possible to get kind of an FVP like reconstruction algorithm um, where that's not gonna make me like a ton of assumptions or use some fancy regularizer like I talked about earlier in the talk. So like if you're doing a study for a colleague for you know imaging whale bone or something like that, it might be good to like start with a recon like that and then apply some of those other fancy recon techniques do some of those different images just to confirm that there's nothing really weird going on and um, and so forth. Um, that would be my recommendation there. Then we've got the camp of just basic iterative. So now we're talking about like ADER, ACER, IDOS, uh, the Siemens Sapphire, IRIS. These methods, they're all gonna assume that there is some region of the patient with a low spatial frequency content over which you can aggressively denoise. Okay, so in other words, like in the bladder, if it's filled with urine, like big uniform region, it should do really well in a big flat uniform region like that. Um, the assumption means yeah, the noise reduction is higher in uniform regions relative to highly textured regions. So again, I showed you guys that example with the sponge versus the water that the Duke group did. This is this kind of algorithm is going to have better noise reduction in, the, in a uniform bladder type than it would in a highly textured like ground glass opacity in the lung or inside the, the, the brain with all the gray white changes. 
the next you'll see the vendors kind of talk about like they have advanced iterative reconstruction algorithms and the line between these two is very blurry you know some of them are claiming that they're using like projection data and, and so forth to do these reconstructions it's very much not clear for those of you i understand you know there's a lot of grad students uh, on the call like if you've actually you know i'm sure some of you have coded up maybe some of these reconstructions to do a full model-based recon and forward and back projection and model all that system geometry and have it iterative you know that takes a lot of time and some of these vendors advanced methods are just flying off the scanner so it's arguable or questionable as to how exactly they're doing that and if it's truly always projection domain but anyway i digress so here we're talking about like ge's acer v canon's first uh, siemens admire phillips imr um, so these are kind of the same conclusions I made as above, except they just have slightly more advanced modeling of the system noise properties and sampling geometry. So they usually have some kind of increase in performance. So they might be doing things like trying to view weight um, different projections a little bit for what would might be you know a lateral projection that's more noisy than an AP projection and in including that into the recon. After that, you have got model based, and I, I think the only two that I put into this camp, and you can see first is in both because it's not always clear from the vendor, you know, wading through what they've published and what's in their marketing material, right? Um, but these would be model based. So a true model based algorithm, and I put a citation in here for what that really looks like. Um, you're doing a full modeling of the what the actual focal spot distribution, right? It's not an infinitely small point. The tube would the anode would melt, right? It has some physical extent. That physical extent will change as a function of MA, as KV. It will fluctuate in space time as the as the scan progresses. If you're actually accounting for all those things, th that would be a full blown model based model. Um, uh, point for the individual detector elements, right? The detectors are not like magical little squares, right? There are some little dead spaces. Um, their sensitivity is not uniform across them. So if you're actually modeling all of that, that would be. Um, part of this model based thing and then the the, the x-ray spectra itself right <laughs> like when you do a simple fpp you just to solve the integrals and the math to make the math work you, you just assume that the spectrums at some uh effective energy right we the, the, some of these model based methods will, will go beyond that and actually model the polychromatic nature of the beam it'll also accurately model the photon statistics of the raw projection data right like if you're doing a reconstruction and you've got an elliptical object the ray is going through sideways, you know, through the long axis of the ellipse. They have a lot more noise than the than the other rays, so you can um, statistically weight that data to give like more preference to the data that's got better photon statistics. So again, uh, if you go in this is open source, you can see a more. If you're interested in more of the math and, and results there, when you take into all this stuff into account, your recon is very long, but you can get nicer looking images. Um, I think especially this paper shows like better uh, spatial resolution when you account for all of those things. So the last bucket, this would be our deep learning methods. And it's already not um, fully inclusive because I think uh, Philips is the third OEM that has come out with a deep learning. And it wouldn't surprise me if I Googled United Imaging, the Chinese uh, manufacturer, if they also did. I'm pretty sure, I don't think Siemens yet has come out with one, um, but I know Philips has. So anyway, um, I would expect all the major OEMs to be coming out with this within the next year, a few years. But Canon's is called ACE, uh, GE is True Fidelity or on the scanner DLIR. And then we've got two of the PAX based companies I talked about earlier, Clary Pi and Algomatica Pixel Shine. So here again, the key is these methods assume the scam data share feature characteristics with the data used to train the model. Right. So these methods assume one desires the output of the reconstruction to match the data used to train the model. Therefore, images reconstructing using DL will have image quality characteristics matching those of the training data, which is awesome if your training data had a nice noise texture that your radiologists actually like. Okay, don't worry, we're not going to go through this slide like I did the last one, um, but this one uh, also is a review from a, of, you know, we're not just going to like make statements like we did on the last slide without backing them up with what people have shown in the peer reviewed literature. So that's what this table uh, did in that review paper where we kind of make comments about um, the availability of them. Right. So these vendor um, agnostic ones, these are the ones that can run on packs. The uh, example references of clinical performance. Right. So there's some kind of patient involved with a subjective or quantitative scoring or noise measurements in a descending aorta or something. Physics-based measurements, so that's our phantom measurements, um, noise power um, 
spectrum. So here, why we included these two columns is because there's so many complaints in the community about the plastic appearance of images. So we wanted to comment on if they have been published to show a shift to the left or to the right in the noise power. <clears throat> and then lastly, the contrast dependent spatial resolution, if it's present or if it's um, uh, not, uh, not present. Okay, so I just have a few more slides. Um, no, yeah, we well, should have good time for a Q&A. One of the comments I want to make too, um, because a lot of people come to me and they, they're doing a study and they kind of think naively, um, and I used to think this way too, that like, you know, the vendor publishes an algorithm, they apply it on a scanner, and it's like that for all the scanners. And that's like usually never the case, okay? They're always going to be making little tweaks to that. And depending on what scanner and what software version you have, that'll change uh, over time. So here I'm just showing, you know, those different images I've been using between three different types of, these are these are GE scanners, but I'm not picking on GE here. Uh, this is going to be somewhere everywhere. Different flavors of the same algorithm, you know, implemented on different actual uh, models of the same manufacturer. You can see there's differences in the performance here. So I think as clinical physicists out there in the community, you know, you can't take, you can't read one paper and then be 100% confident that those results are going to be exactly like the flavor of, of algorithm that you have on your scanner. All right. And this was the slide I made for um, Dr. Watson, right? You know, right when we were right before. So we were talking about CT number and I, and I realized I didn't include anything about that, but obviously um, we, we, we've looked at this and of course it's important, you know, I, you know, in your environment for treatment planning calculations for, I know a lot of you, the folks at McGill are, are working on that in research and clinical duties, but even in, in, in radiology, of course, we, our RADs are taking ROI measurements routinely every day of little lesions and seeing how much they wash out or if their value is changing over the time, or, you know, they want to know if it's filled with fat or water, or I, if iodine's coming in, what's the enhancement value, et cetera. So, we looked at that for for one of these, and other authors have looked at them for the other vendors. This was this was for GE's method. There's a bunch of GE co-authors on here, but basically we found no statistical difference in CT number between uh, filtered back projection and, and the deep learning, and even for the ACERV. There was a little bit of statistically significant difference across dose level, but again, that was only fractions of of um, Houndsville units. So yeah, uh, with that, I thank you all uh, for your attention and. Um, look forward to entertaining and hopefully answering any any questions you guys might have. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Very interesting talk. Uh, we have time now for questions for Dr. S.